Um, now, in this particular case, is this force doing positive work or negative work? Negative. Because it's actually, the component that's parallel is actually anti-parallel to the velocity, so it would be doing negative work. So this is a force that is both slowing us down and changing our direction. A second ago you said, gee, I, I thought that whenever you change direction you have to slow down. Well, that's not true in general, but it could be true in an individual case. This is a case where what you said would be correct, where the force is both changing our direction and slowing us down. But that doesn't have to be the case. We could have a force that's just changing our direction. Uh, okay. Um, so going back to here, what would we say is the component of the force that is parallel to the velocity here? Is it the entire force? Is it a component of the force? Or is it zero? The entire force. So in this case, we would plug this entire force into this equation. Sometimes that messes people up. They know they're only supposed to plug in the component that's parallel, and they get confused when the whole force is parallel. But here, we would say these are the same thing. Just for practice, what would we say is f perpendicular in this case, the component of the force that's perpendicular to the velocity? Is that, yeah, that's right. It doesn't exist. So in this case, notice that down here we made a little right triangle to break this into components. But you wouldn't make a right triangle here, because it's already broken into the only component that matters. Well, let's do the same thing over here. Um, what, what would we say is f parallel here? The whole force. Yeah. This, we can also use this for, the component that, for a component that's anti-parallel. So here, this is the component that's anti-parallel. And what would we say about f perpendicular in this case? Zero. All right. How about here? What would f parallel be in this case? And that's another way to see why this is doing zero work, because we would plug in zero for f parallel. Um, we would not plug in this, because this is not parallel. What can we say about f perpendicular in this case? It's the whole force. Right. Most of the time when you're doing work problems, though, you don't even bother identifying f perpendicular, because that's not what we want to plug in. What you would identify is f parallel. This is the only case we've seen where there was both a component that was parallel and a component that was perpendicular. So this was the only case where we actually had to draw a right triangle to break this into components. How would we do this with trig? Well, should we use the sine or the cosine to find f parallel here, if this is the angle between f and v? Uh, Didn't sound too happy about that, <laughs> but that's right. Do you remember Sokotoa? Now, this is the side that is adjacent to the hypotenuse. Or, well, no, I shouldn't put that right. This side here is adjacent to the angle that we're focusing on. So we want to use cosine because that's the one that focuses on adjacent. We don't want to use sine because that focuses on the side that is opposite to the angle that you're focusing on. So in this case, we could say that f parallel, well, we could say that the sine of theta is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. This is the side that's adjacent to theta. And the overall vector is the hypotenuse. But then we can simply cross multiply here. And we would get that the component of f that's parallel, I'm not messing up. So what you said before was right. We should be using the cosine. We should be using the cosine of theta because the cosine refers to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And f parallel here is adjacent to theta. So I should have been using the cosine. So we get that f parallel is f times the cosine of theta. So that would give us another equation here. This is an equation you might have seen in class for work. f times the displacement times the cosine of theta. But the important thing to see here is that the only purpose of the cosine theta here is just to break this into the only component that matters. It's just to isolate the component of the overall force that's parallel to the, uh, to the movement. I think uh, for a beginning student, it's better to use this formula because it gives you a better intuition for what you're doing, and we don't have to, to, to get into the trade too much. All right, so I think we'll go back to, uh, to using this equation, usually. All right, so this is our general equation for work. Well, there's other types of energy besides the kinetic energy. For example, there's the gravitational potential energy. Do you happen to remember what the formula is for gravitational potential energy? MGH. It's good that you know that. What would M stand for? The mass. Yeah, and G? 
gravity. Yeah, that's the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. And how about h? The height. That's right. Now, this is the vertical height only, only the vertical component of the height, so to speak. The vertical height. <clears throat> now, <coughs> This is, uh, the, the potential energy here is related to the weight on the object. Um, so this is kind of a potential energy related to the weight force. Only certain types of forces have potential energies. Only conservative forces have potential energies. So the weight must be a conservative force because it has a potential energy. So we should memorize what are the conservative forces. Um, and uh, in this semester, you're only going to see two conservative forces, which are the weight and the spring force. So we can simply make a note. The only conservative forces you're going to see this semester are the weight and the spring force, which means those are the only two types of potential energy you're going to be seeing, because it's only conservative forces that have potential energies. Every other force you're going to see this semester is non-conservative. So if it's not the weight or the spring force, you can assume that it's non-conservative. Next semester, you'll also learn about the electric force, which is conservative, but you won't get to that this semester. All right, now we have another concept, which is the mechanical energy. So we can use capital E to stand for the mechanical energy, and the mechanical energy is just the kinetic plus the potential energy. So the total mechanical energy is all the kinetic energy plus all the potential energy. All right, and now I think we're ready to see what the key equation is for solving problems here. So the key equation for solving problems here is that the initial mechanical energy plus the net work by the non-conservative forces equals the final mechanical energy. So what we'll try to do a bunch of problems using this equation. What does this stand for? This is the initial mechanical energy. What does this stand for? Well, NC here stands for non-conservative. We're only going to plug in here the work that's done by the non-conservative forces. Everything except the spring force and friction. But we wouldn't put in the work done by the spring, I'm sorry, everything but the spring force and the weight. So we wouldn't put in any work done by weight or the spring force here. Um, and then this would be the final mechanical energy. Now you're going to see a lot of problems where the network from the non-conservative forces is zero. Well, if the network from the non-conservative forces is zero, then we just have that the initial mechanical energy equals the final mechanical energy. That's conservation of energy. Conservation is just a fancy word for something being constant. So if mechanical energy is being conserved, that just means that it's constant. Well, if something is constant, that means that its initial value is the same as the final value. So this will be the general framework that we're going to use a lot for solving problems, just plugging into this equation. <coughs> 